committee will come to order. Before uh, turning to our legislative business for the day, I would like to welcome Representative uh, Luke Meyer to the committee. I understand the gentleman from Missouri has a banking regulator, was a banking regulator early in his career, and uh, we really appreciate having the expertise of, uh, on the committee as we continue to focus on the economic crisis that we now find ourselves in, so we want to welcome him. And pursuant to committee rules 8A, and with the concurrence of the ranking member, I am assigning Mr. Lukemeyer to the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs and the Subcommittee on uh, Government Management, Organization, and Procurement. Uh, I thank the gentleman for his interest in our important oversight and legislative work and yield to the ranking member for any comments that he might have at this time. Uh, ranking member, Mr. Michael. Uh, I just uh, want to uh, also extend on behalf of the uh, Republican side of the aisle here uh, welcoming of uh, Blaine Luke Dumeyer of uh, uh, Missouri's 9th Congressional District. Pleased to have you here. I can tell you we need every vote we can get on this side of the aisle and uh, very pleased to uh, also have the expertise which uh, the chairman related to your background which will be invaluable. This is one of the great uh, committees in Congress. In fact, uh, 17 years ago as a freshman I came here and this gentleman was my chairman and I've always used this gentleman as the model of how people should um, operate uh, their committee and respect members. Uh, uh, Mr. Towns was, was, has always been my model. He treated me uh, as a full partner in the congressional process and I've respected that ever since. So I, we we're, we're kind of joking here that here we are uh, some uh, years uh, past and I, I'm back in my minority seat and he's uh, my chairman. But you're very uh, fortunate to be on this great committee that's charged with oversight and responsibility which is so important in, in Congress and goes back to the history beginning history of the Republic this committee does and its responsibility. So welcome and uh, you'll learn a lot from um, uh, modeling yourself after Mr. Towns and some of the uh, members on both sides of the aisle who work in a bipartisan manner. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for your kind words. You're right, it brings back memories 17 years ago. Uh, yes, uh, Congressman Burton and we, after that we yes, yield Mr. to. Uh, Mr. Chairman. First of all, uh, we have an opening statement, uh, and I was going to have Mr. Micah read it, but he can't read. So uh, I thought that was pretty he, he could read 17 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> what in, happened? In any event, I, I, I agree with everything he said about uh, your ability to lead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this bill would authorize the Department of Justice Mr. to pay— Hold a second now. Yeah, hold a second now. I think you, you're jumping ahead of us a little bit. You're I may not be able to bit. read, but I know that I know the order of business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're jumping in. <laughs> you're jumping in. I would like to recognize Mr. Luca Meyer for, for comments. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member. Uh, it's certainly an honor to be here, and obviously it's going to be not only an interesting uh, committee, but an entertaining one as well. So I look forward to the debate. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> We will now turn to our legislative business. Uh, the committee today will consider legislation to move employees of the Transportation Security Administration into the government-wide civil service system. We are also considering bills to allow agencies to retain the proceeds from the sale of surplus real realty property, a bill to permit the District of Columbia to use Kingman and Heritage Island in accordance with the Anacosta Waterfront Plan and a bill to authorize the FBI to pay moving and relocation expenses for the families of agents of, or employees who are killed in the line of duty. Finally, the committee will consider several commemorative resolutions. Uh, the committee will first consider H.R. 1881, the Transportation Workforce Enhancement Act of 2009. This legislation requires the Transportation Security Administration to adopt the personnel rules and workplace protections that apply to nearly all other government agencies. H.R. 1881 was introduced by Representative Nita Lowy of New York and was reported favorably by the Homeland Security Committee under the leadership of Chairman Thompson shortly before the August recess. 
This bill, which transitions the TSA out of its current personnel system and into Title V of the United States Code, is long overdue. It, it, it will help the agencies deal with the high attrition, low, low morale, and severe workplace energy rates that have plagued the agency since its creation in 2001. This committee has jurisdiction over the Title V civil service system. We understand it is not perfect and are always considering ways to fine, time, to fine tune and reform it. Nevertheless, the rules are re and requirements of Title V have provided generations of federal employees with a fair and transparent approach to their federal employment. The merit system principles embodied in Title V, including the right to bargain collectively, help to promote an efficient and accountable civil service. In contrast, when the TSA was established in 2001, Congress provided the new agency with nearly un unqualified authority to define all terms of pay, benefit, and conditions of employment for its airport screeners. The use of this authority has created significant uncertainty within TSA. TSA has used its authority to exempt the agency from many laws that govern the rest of the civil service, such as the Rehabilitation Act, the right to appeal adverse actions to the Merit System Protection Board, general schedule pay, and until recently, the Whistleblower Protection Act. This lack of consistency and transparency in TSA's personnel system lowers employee morale and increases attrition within the agency. H.R. 1881 addresses this situation by repealing authority for the existing TSA personnel management system and provides rules for transitioning its employees into Title V. This will place TSA's employees on par with their colleagues and DHS as the rest of the and the rest of the federal civil service um, uh, as well. It should be stressed that this will not affect existing federal law that prohibits federal employees from striking, and it would not modify existing training and certification requirements of TSA's personnel. In the 110th Congress, the House of Representatives passed similar rights and protections for TSA personnel as part of H.R. 1. The implementing the recommendations of the 911 Commission Act have under the threat of a veto from the Bush administration, the protections were removed in conference with the Senate. President Obama has supported these protections. I want to note that we have in the audience today uh, uh, several um, transportation security officers from airports around the country. They are in town this week for an American Federation of Government Employees Summit and are here in support of this bill. And I thank them for their interest and their support as well. This is a good bill. It is long overdue, and I urge all members to support it. I yield now to the ranking member of this committee. Well, thank you uh, uh, for yielding and uh, the opportunity to comment on this. We do have a difference of opinion on this uh, particular uh, measure. And uh, let me first of all uh, preface my remarks with a couple of uh, personal observations. Uh, when we created TSA, actually I'm the individual that picked the name Transportation Security Administration. I've told folks uh, by some fate the good Lord had me become uh, the chairman of the Aviation Subcommittee in early uh, 2001. So I inherited the responsibility to uh, put together in fairly rapid order uh, a transportation security plan uh, for uh, the United States and was one of the principal authors of the legislation. So I'm, I'm fairly familiar with what uh, took place and why we did certain things. Uh, previous to that, on this committee, I served four years as the uh, chairman of the Servil Civil Service Subcommittee, uh, and I really enjoyed that. We made many improvements to benefit the welfare uh, of our uh, hardworking federal employees. And I might also preface my remarks that uh, uh, our TSA employees are hardworking, dedicated, uh, uh, federal uh, workers. First of all, uh, we, we had a bipartisan agreement, and it is ironic one day before the anniversary of that tragedy that struck uh, our nation uh, that we, uh, we undertake to un undo a bipartisan agreement. That bipartisan agreement was based on what we thought was best for the 
nation, and that was not to have uh, screeners, airport screeners, under uh, the protection of uh, Title V, and we did that purposely. Now, again, as chairman of civil service, I can tell you those who work for the federal government are protected under Title V. It's very difficult to fire, remove, and also sometimes discipline those employees. It's just very difficult with all the things that we set up in that system. We did, we did not want that to be the case, Republicans and Democrats, that it would be difficult to hire and fire those individuals. What we did do was give them the right to join a union, and we thought that was an important uh, right, and they do have that right, but not to co collectively bargain uh, for wages, hours, and, uh, and also be under the protections of uh, uh, Title V. Uh, we did that because we wanted, again, to be able to, to take poor performers out immediately. Uh, and uh, again, in a, 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 a very broad bipartisan agreement. So we're undoing that. Now, I started uh, working with the, uh, replacing the private screeners. Many people think the private screeners failed on September 11th. There were 16,500 private screeners prior to 9-11 working uh, uh, under, uh, uh, again, a private uh, system. What failed on September 11th was the federal government. The federal government had debated and not been able to put in, in place rules for uh, the workforce, the uh, private sector workforce, and uh, it was left in limbo. So there were no protocols or proper uh, procedures for training and all the other requirements, uh, way, uh, some of the other things that are so important to, in the uh, training and having a good workforce in place. The second thing, uh, we never put in pl uh, place any bans the federal government did on things like box cutters, which we now know were, were used in the attack. In fact, the federal government failed at its directive to pilots, which was actually issued uh, and in place on the date of September 11th, said that the uh, pilots and the crew should cooperate with uh, with the, uh, the terrorist hijackers and actually uh, referred to getting to them uh, to land in Cuba. That was how uh, that system failed. Instead, we put in place, uh, and it was going to be a small workforce. Initially, and look at the debate, there were going to be, instead of 16,500, some 19,000 screeners. Then we're going to have 24,000 screeners. Then we're going to have 40,000 screeners. Then we're going to have 48,000 screeners capped. As of uh, last month, I was given these statistics before I even knew about this hearing. We had 58,840 uh, uh, TSA screeners. In addition to that, the bureaucracy has grown. We have 3,000, on top of that now, we have 3,183 people in TSA and administration in Washington, D.C., making an average of $103,698. We are now bigger than the D Department of Commerce, uh, the National Aeronautics Space Administration, EPA, the Department of State, the Department of Labor, Department of Energy, General Services Administration, the list goes on, and I'll submit that for the record. Uh, folks, th this it, uh, would be a mistake. What, what happened is the bureaucracy grew. We also provided in the TSA legislation the ability to opt out and have private screeners under federal super, supervision. Right now, TSA is both the administrator, the regulator, and the auditor of this system, and that's wrong. And I've had the system tested time and time again, and they find that the five uh, private screening operations and others that have gone private operate, and this is, are not my words, but the words of the General Accounting Office, statistically a significantly better performance than the federal screeners. That's not my evaluation of their performance. So uh, we've put in place this gigantic bureaucracy, bigger than the Coast Guard, bigger than half a dozen federal agencies. Uh, we wanted to have certain protections uh, for those folks, uh, which we have given them. 
Now we're going to lock them into a collective bargaining system which will distort, again, what we intended in a bipartisan agreement in the beginning. So I, I, I apologize for, uh, for going on, uh, but I want this in the record, and, and people should know that I believe that one day before the eighth anniversary of se September 11th, a horrible day in our history, we're making a big, big mistake. Thank you, and you yield back let, the let balance think, of my I, time. I thank you, gentlemen, but I need to let the record reflect that uh, the Dems on this committee fought it all the way. So I just want to make that very clear. We fought it. Um, yes. Um, I, I thank the gentleman for his leadership on, in naming TSA and, and really all the wonderful work you've done in transportation, the high-speed rail. It's all very commendable. But uh, many of us on this side of the aisle fought very hard for TSA to be federalized and to be federal employees. When we walk into the Capitol, we're protected by a federal police force, a police force. Uh, we have uh, city and state police forces that protect us in our cities. And something as important as protecting um, our, what goes into the belly of a plane, what goes into the plane with the passengers' bodies or with their, with their uh, suitcases is incredibly important. This is a, a, a federal protection matter of the highest order, and we need a professional federal workforce uh, that is highly trained, that has background checks, and uh, that we can rely on uh, because we know, and I've been in the airport, when they have found uh, things in, in suitcases, they've found those cutter knives again in planes, uh, they have found pla in planes where they've tried to beat down the doors into the cockpit, all of this since 9-11. Uh, and, and so I just wanted to speak out in favor of this bill and in favor of a federal workforce if it's good enough to protect us in the cities, in our states, and in, in the capital, then it's good enough to protect us in, in the airports. And, and I would say that a federal workforce that has gone through the protections and has the high degree of standards before they are hired uh, uh, speaks uh, volumes. And, and the final point is, we know, I'm not on the Intelligence Committee, but I've heard the rumors and I've heard the rumblings from the police department in New York City and other places, that there have been a number of efforts uh, to violate our, our planes. And um, they continue to be a, part, a target. And to have a federalized workforce is important. Uh, they have an important mission. And uh, they are there to protect the American people. And the final line is we have not had another uh, incident on the planes since then. And so I want to congratulate them on the hard work they're doing the responsibility that they have, and I, and I support this legislation. I want to thank the gentleman from New York. Uh, anyone on the side? Yes. Gentleman from Tennessee. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, for six years, uh, uh, from 1995 until the beginning of 2001, I had the privilege of chairing the Aviation Subcommittee just prior to uh, uh, Chairman Mike, and um, I can uh, back up everything that he just uh, uh, said and, and second. And in fact, in the um, 1996 FAA Re Reauthorization Act, the FAA was required to certify all the screeners and set up a, a procedure about their training and so forth. And uh, uh, they um, issued a um, certification of screening companies um, in um, January of 2000. And, and Later that year, we held a hearing on this to check into it and see. And so all of those things that uh, Chairman Mike had just said about, uh, Mr. Mike had just said about um, the screeners and what's happened since then was uh, exactly correct and was backed up by that uh, hearing that we held in 2000 and, he and subsequent hearings to that. Unfortunately, the civil service system as we have now, it, uh, it uh, doesn't really do anything much for uh, hardworking, dedicated uh, employees, it, but it serves, uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Mike has said, it serves as a protection for uh, the bad employees, the lazy, incompetent employees. And in that way, it is unfair to those who are working hard and who are doing a good job and who are having to carry a load, carry the load of and do the work for the lazy, incompetent employees who are protected 
so much by the civil service system that it's almost impossible to get rid of them. So uh, this bill sounds good on the surface, but it's going to be very harmful to a lot of good, dedicated, hardworking employees in the long run. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Congresswoman from uh, Washington, D.C. Federal lies. Um, <clears throat> uh, these important employees uh, has been vindicated uh, clearly to have the airlines, airline by airline, uh, taking on a primary security function after 9-11 uh, had been demonstrated to be uh, unacceptable. What was not demonstrated was that it was necessary somehow for these employees to be singled out to be deprived of the right to bargain collectively. Uh, I disagree with my very good friend, the ranking member, uh, that this was a, quote, bipartisan act. It was just the opposite. This was extremely controversial. I remember sitting in this room on that side of the aisle at the time in the minority uh, when amendment after amendment uh, was um, tried in order to uh, keep a, this kind of, of, of uh, deprivation and denial from occurring. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, I very much appreciate that in that this year before the year is, o is over, you have brought this matter before us. I think many have waited uh, for this day. Uh, the right to bargain collectively would be on any list of basic American rights, and it would be on any list of, of denials that you would expect of an authoritarian state. That's just how basic the right to bargain is. So this is a right you don't withdraw. And in withdrawing it or disallowing it, uh, we have given TSA a green light to not only take down, uh, of course, the right to bargain collectively, which the Congress did, but to take down a whole host of civil service rights, some of them necessary for security itself, such as the whistleblower uh, statute. Wouldn't one want, of all people, uh, the, the, the TSA employees to have uh, whistleblower status? Uh, they took down uh, certain rights for veterans uh, who have preference in federal employment. A whole set of, of uh, for, for many of us, I'm sure, unintended consequences uh, flowed from this. Mr. Chairman, uh, the right to bargain in our system is very hard to achieve. One goes through many, many um, steps in order to achieve it. Uh, it should never be withdrawn or disallowed unless it can be demonstrated that there is substantial harm to society, the substantial harm has been done when we deny a basic American right to some of our employees while others retain the right to bargain collectively. I appreciate very much this bill and I appreciate your bringing it forward before the year was over. Yield back the balance of my time. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman. And I yield uh, to the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I Briefly wanted to say we battled through some of this in, in Homeland Security Committee. Uh, the screeners here are not typical government employees, and that the uh, point that my friend from Tennessee made uh, about uh, protections and uh, protecting the weakest uh, in the union here has a different connotation than uh, all of our federal departments are important and all of local police is important, but a lazy screener can mean the death of thousands of people. And the ability to discipline, the ability to fire, has to be different in this type of situation. And while I uh, uh, believe that we've worked some of those matters out and uh, understand some of the major debate here, comparing this to other agencies is not appropriate and has much greater risk to the American flying public than a traditional department. You'll back. Thank you very much. Uh Gentleman from Ohio, Ms. Kucinich. 
Mr. Chairman, I, I want to thank you for bringing this bill up for consideration. Uh, for those of you who were here at the time that the Homeland Security bill was uh, offered to the Congress, one of the reasons why I voted against the Homeland Security bill was because when I saw the way the bill was written, it didn't provide labor protections. And in effect, the um, administration at that time capitalized on the air of fear to uh, create a second-class citizen of federal employees. Now, my, my colleague from Washington, D.C., uh, started to talk about some of the disparities that exist in the TSA employees not having access to certain legal protections. I, I'd like to enumerate them here. That uh, TSA, according to our staff memo, has used its authority to exempt the agency from many laws that govern the rest of civil service, such as the Civil Service Reform Act, the Whistleblower Protection Act, the Rehabilitation Act, the right to appeal adverse actions to the Merit Systems Protection Board, general schedule pay requirements, and the right to seek the Office of Special Counsel's assistance to remedy violations of veterans' preference and the Uniformed Service Employment and Reemployment Rights Act. Now, what this bill does that we're considering, it will provide rules for transitioning all employees into Title V of the U.S. Code. And as part of the transition to Title V, H.R. Uh, 1881 would make applicable Chapter 71 relating to collective bargaining. So at last, you're going to see collective bargaining rights extended to TSA employees. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to go on strike because that's not permitted under this law. But it does mean that it's a recognition that you have the right to collective bargaining. It's a fundamental right for workers. You know, I'm a strong supporter of labor rights. I've co-sponsored this act. I support the bill because it's a testament to our advancing the rights of federal employees. This legislation takes important steps to ensure that our transportation security officers are afforded the same rights as every other employee of the Department of Homeland Security. When, um, when we passed this bill, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, uh, I, well, as we get ready, I'd like to submit into the record uh, various statements that I made relative to this matter about uh, uh, security employees. And I'd like to have this, uh, uh, without objection, enter into the record some statements that I've made in the past uh, relative to the um, uh, rights of transportation security workers. And also, I want to say that in April of 2008, when the House considered legislation recognizing the fifth anniversary of the Department of Homeland Security, uh, while I unequivocally honor and support the work of all employees in uh, the Department of Homeland Security, I couldn't support a Department of Homeland Security that didn't provide its transportation security officers one of the most basic labor rights, the right to collective bargaining. So I was one of three members, one of three members in the House to vote against that bill. Um, the federal government must serve as the model for fair labor laws. And this legislation is an important step in the right direction. And I want to urge my colleagues to support the bill. And I want to thank the employees of TSA for the work that they do in protecting our families, in protecting our friends, protecting our loved ones. A lot of responsibility goes into your hands. And we should show our appreciation for that responsibility by making sure that you have the full protection of the laws that would be available to every other employee of Homeland Security. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I uh, yield back. And again, thank you, TSA employees, for the work that you do. You are much appreciated. Much thank appreciated. Thank you, gentleman from Ohio, for his statement. Uh, I now yield to the gentleman from California, Congressman Bill Bray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, Mr. Chairman, I think all of us as frequent flyers will uh, stand by the statement that TSA workers are some of the most polite and courteous um, public employees any of us can meet. And I say that as a former public employee. 
So I think that is not an issue here today. Um, uh, the issue here today is, is really about the fact that the entire agency as we know it was, was created under the assumption that the existing situation would be the rule of law. Um, it was a compromise, even though some didn't agree to it. It was a bipartisan compromise that the creation would be done under this type of labor agreement. Um, I'll just tell you as one, I wasn't in the House at that time, but I was around enough to know the compromise that was worked out and how tough it was. And um, I have a bigger complaint, uh, concern here, and that is I seem to appear, it seems to appear in this, not just this chamber, but across the Capitol, that there's this amnesia going on in eight years, that we're forgetting how we got to where we are now. I mean, the Senate right now, Mr. Uh, Chairman, is talking about repealing the requirement that a flyer show a viable document before getting on an airplane. The Senate's actually considered retreating from the concept of viable documentation because it's not a big deal anymore. I think that one of the concerns here is just understanding that there was a whole lot of things we forgot about. Um, IDs being given to people who are illegally in the country by Virginia. Now, Virginia corrected that, but you still got states around that are not making sure that IDs are viable. Um, we're talking about the fact that we had terrorists get on airplanes because they weren't required to show their Saudi Arabian passport because, it, because they were given IDs in the United States even though they were illegally in the country. All these things seem to be getting forgotten. How did we get here? And all I have to say is that if we're not willing to stand by the compromise, if the majority wants to retreat from that agreement, is the majority also saying now that all federal employees should be under this, this, um, the same agreement? Are you willing to publicly state today that the million men and women that are in uniform today that do not get the same protection are going to be given this protection by the new majority? That they're going to now create this union environment for every employee, everybody who gets a paycheck from the federal government? Because be upfront about that. Is that the goal of this proposal? I think what this proposal is, is coming forward with is a retreat from the compromise that created the agency. And as much I appreciate the service that the individuals give me as a consumer, every time one of our citizens go through the, the check system, I also got to recognize that this was part of the arrangement and the agreement for the creation of the TSA. And to retreat from it now at the dawn of the anniversary of the tragedy I think it's quite inappropriate. It may be good politics, but it's not good policy. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen from California for the statement. Gentleman from Virginia. I thank the chairman, and I thank him for, uh, for bringing up this bill. Uh, you know, this is the uh, Oversight and Government Reform Committee, and what we're doing here is looking at how well something works. Uh, this, isn't about, uh, this isn't about higher principles necessarily. It's about uh, the, the bread and butter of how the federal government works. And I, I heard the ranking member compare the TSA and its growth to other federal agencies. Well, if we look at the problem, for example, of TSA attrition and quit rates, uh, TSA is about the size of the Social Security Administration. But 1,209 TSA employees quit between October of last year and March of this year, a quit rate four times that of the Social Security Administration. The termination firing rate was also four times as high as the Social Security Administration. In fiscal year 2008, TSA had a 10.9% quit rate compared to a government-wide quit rate of 4.7%. So the very sacred mission our good friend from California just cited needs to be met. And the question is, what's going wrong that we have such a high attrition and firing rate in TSA? And perhaps part of the answer is the same protections provided their brothers and sisters in federal service are not provided to them. And that's what this legislation is designed to do and designed to make sure that we do have moving forward the trained, skilled workforce to protect the American public, our friend from California so eloquently described. I support the legislation. Thank you, gentleman from Virginia. I now yield to the gentleman from Arizona. Carson I thank Flake. the gentleman for yielding. I, like Mr. Kucinich, uh, did not vote for the legislation back when. One of the things I worried about was exactly what's occurring now, that this bipartisan compromise that was agreed to would be undone uh, later on. And uh, I, I, so 
concerns have been realized here, and I don't, don't think we should move forward. With that, I yield two minutes to the gentleman from uh, Florida. Well, uh, thank you for yielding, and just let me respond. The uh, uh, gentleman from Virginia is correct in that the uh, termination rate is four times as great. That's exactly what we intended uh, when we reached this compromise, uh, because uh, our concern was performance. Um, let me tell you all something, too. I can't disclose the classified uh, briefings that I've had, but I'm, I'm very concerned about the performance uh, in TSA. Uh, and the most recent briefings I've had, too, the, f the performance has fallen off the charts. Uh, and uh, we need to do something about that. One of the things we need to do is also imp uh, put in place uh, technology. Unfortunately, technology will replace, and technology where we have good technology in place, uh, it does rep replace personnel. For an example, inline check baggage systems work almost flawlessly, and again, we have classified results that can can uh, demonstrate uh, that. But uh, they replace uh, two thirds of the personnel. Uh, those positions are eliminated. Uh, we. We also, uh, I have no argument with uh, wages. I have no argument with uh, whistleblower protection. In fact, we work to, I believe they do have whistleblower protection, but through an administrative process uh, that was set up. I have no problem with legislating that. What we want to do here is to make certain that we are able to terminate poor performers. And I'm telling you, Right now, we have a problem with poor performance, and we should be able to terminate immediately those who do not perform well in this most important uh, responsibility. Yield back. Thank you. Any other members seeking recognition? If no other members wish to speak, I now ask unanimous consent that H.R. 1881 uh, be brought up at this time. H.R. 1881, a bill to enhance the transportation security functions of the Department of Homeland Security by providing for an enhanced personnel system for employees of the transportation I security. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point without objection so ordered. Are there any amendments to the bill? Hearing no amendments, I now move that the Committee on Oversight and Government Re Form report H.R. 1881 to the House with the recommendation that the bill do pass. The question is favorably reporting H.R. 1881 to the House. All those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. aye. Opposes? Aye. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to, and H.R. 1881 is ordered reported. Mr. Chairman, on that, I'd uh, request a recorded vote. Right. The gentleman from uh, uh, requested a recorded vote, so I ask the clerk to call the roll. Mr. Towns. Aye. Mr. Towns votes aye. Mr. Kanjorski. Ms. Maloney. Mrs. Maloney. Mr. Cummings. Aye. Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Tierney. Aye. Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Clay. Ms. Watson. Mr. Lynch, Mr. Cooper, Mr. Connolly, Mr. Connolly votes aye, Mr. Quigley, Mr. Quigley votes aye, Ms. Captor, Ms. Captor votes aye, Ms. Norton, Ms. Norton votes aye, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Kennedy votes aye, Mr. Davis, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Cuellar, Mr. Cuellar votes aye, Mr. Hodes, Mr. Hodes votes aye, Mr. Murphy, Mr. Murphy votes aye, Mr. Welch, Mr. Welch votes aye, Mr. Foster, Mr. Foster votes aye, Ms. Spear, Ms. Spear votes aye, Mr. Driehaus, Mr. Driehaus votes aye. Mr. Kanjorski, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Issa, <coughs> Mr. Burton, uh, no. Mr. Ver Burton votes no, 
Mr. McHugh. Mr. Micah. Mr. Micah votes no. Mr. Souter. Mr. Souter votes no. Mr. Duncan. Mr. Duncan votes no. Mr. Turner. Mr. Westmoreland. Mr. McHenry. Mr. Bill Bray. Mr. Bill Bray votes no. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Flake. Mr. Flake votes no. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry votes no. Mr. Chaffetz. Mr. Chaffetz votes no. Mr. Schock. Mr. Kanjorski. I'm sorry. Mr. Lutkemeyer. Mr. Lutkemeyer. Mr. Lutkemeyer votes no. Mr. Kanjorski. Mrs. Maloney. Aye. Mrs. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Clay. Ms. Watson. Ms. Watson votes aye. Mr. Lynch. Mr. Cooper. Should I go on? Mr. Chan Kanjorski. Mr. Kanjorski votes aye. Mr. Davis. Mr. Van Hollen. Mr. McHugh, Mr. Turner, Mr. Westmoreland, Mr. McHenry, Mr. Schock, on that vote, Mr. Chairman, I have 19 ayes, 10 noes. The ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to, and H.R. 1881 is ordered reported. The next order of business is H.R. 2495, the Federal Real Property Disposal Enhancement Act of 2009. This bill will make it easier for federal agencies to sell property that they no longer need, addressing the long-standing concern of the Government Accountability Office. This committee and both the Bush and Obama administration, H.R. 2495, was introduced by Representative Dennis Moore of Kansas on May the 19th of this year. It enjoys bipartisan support, as similar legislation did last year. The committee approved a similar bill last year by voice vote, and it is also passed by voice vote when it reached the House floor. H.R. 2495 allows federal agencies to retain proceeds from the sale of surplus real property. The agencies may use those funds to prepare surplus property for sale, to pay for environmental cleanup, demolition, historical preservation, and other necessary measures. The General Service Administration will make the initial payments for these expenses, and the agencies will then reimburse GSA using the proceeds from the property sales. This bill does not change the existing measure for transferring property between federal agencies or making it available for public benefit uses. It is a common sense way to help agencies dispose of property that they may have been sitting on for decades, property worth billions of dollars in total. I urge my members to support this bill, and I yield to the ranking member for any comments that he might have. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, H.R. 2495, the Federal Real Property Disposable, or excuse me, Dispos Disposal Enhancement Act of 2009, seems to be a common sense bill that would help root out some government inefficiency. The GAO has reported that federal agencies are being discouraged from disposing of surplus property because of the costs associated with the process. This bill would help agencies dispose of surplus properties by allowing the funds from the sales of surplus real and related personal property to pay for the inherent costs, such as appraisal, auction, surveying, inspection, etc. 2495 is a pragmatic solution to making government run a little more efficiently, and I support the bill. Mr. Chairman, I urge my colleagues to support it as well. Thank you, and yield back. Any other, yes, um, the gentleman from Virginia, seeking recognition. 
I thank the chairman and, uh, and the ranking member for their comments. Uh, I am sympathetic to the intent of this bill, and I do understand it passed in a voice vote. But I've spent the, the last 14 years before coming here in local government in Fairfax County. Uh, and I had the experience of inter interacting with the federal government in the purchase of a large piece of property declared surplus, the old Lorton prison site for Washington, D.C. Uh, we purchased those 3,000 acres for $4.2 million in legislation, bipartisan legislation, that was moved by your predecessor, Mr. Towns, uh, my friend and my predecessor uh, in the seat, uh, Tom Davis, whose uh, portrait is on the wall. Uh, I believe that uh, there is a risk here of unintended consequences for state and local governments. In this bill, we are incentivizing federal agencies through the GSA to maximize the value of property and dispose of it because they keep the net proceeds. And, uh, and while I understand uh, and am, again, sympathetic with the desire to save money so that we're offloading property we don't need to be having on the books and eliminating the associated maintenance costs, and I support that goal, my concern, which is a relatively limited one, but one motivated from years of experience in local government, that unwittingly we not disincentivize that same federal government from cooperating with state and local governments for other uses for federal property before we sell them to commercial entities. I am concerned that the profit motive could trump the need of state and local governments to preserve and conserve land, for example, or that there may be another use, public use, that they have and they'd like to negotiate with the federal government to have it. While the Property Act does say you've got to consult with state and local governments, it doesn't mandate that the federal government should negotiate a deal at what would be considered below market value in order to expedite that public good. For example, the Lorton property, which we purchased for $4.2 million, 3,000 acres, in Fairfax County, if you had actually sold that property at fair market value for its highest best use for development, would have been worth many, many multiples of $4.2 million and way beyond the reach of the local government to purchase that property and preserve it in perpetuity for public good and recreational purposes. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I want to support this language. I, un I have worked with your staff and I understand you have some clarifying language that reiterates existing law, in effect, but maybe reaffirms the commitment of this committee that no one should misread what we're trying to do here. And I, I yield to the chairman. Let me say, I, I, uh, I really understand. <clears throat> excuse me, I understand your concerns, and I'm willing to continue to work with you uh, to make certain that it's clear, and that we can do this between now and the time it uh, arrives on the floor. And of course, um, uh, I respect the fact that uh, uh, you've had an experience in that uh, in this situation. But here again, uh, I think we need to move it and. Um, and with the understanding that we we'll continue to work with you, and I would ask staff to do so. Mr. Yes. Chairman, uh, is it my understanding that you're not moving language to reaffirm that commitment? Well, you know, actually, uh, do you have an amendment? Uh, well, I, I thought there was language well, that was going to be. Let moved, me say this, you know, I understand that what the gentleman is trying to do. So um, uh, we can do one or two things. We can prepare an amendment here, and uh, and I, I don't like to do that because I always like for, for members to see in terms of what we're doing. And I, I believe in, you know, we talk about transparency. I think committees have to be transparent as well. You know, I'm willing to work with you, but if you want to. Um, uh, we're prepared to offer an amendment if, if, uh, today, but here again, uh, uh, I just feel uncomfortable with the fact that we did not have an opportunity for both sides to see it. But um, 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 I, I don't see a problem with the, with the amendment at all. But I'm willing to also work with you between now and the time we go to the floor to see in terms of what we can do. So uh, it's up to the gentleman, you know. But it's just my own view and feeling over the fact that I don't like to spring amendments out uh, like this. I like for people to be able to see them and be able to look at them and be able to have comments about it. That, that's just the way uh, uh, I, I like to operate. So, so um, think about it for a moment, and let me, me in the meantime, uh, let me go to Mr. Duncan. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for bringing up this uh, uh, bill. This uh, bill is an offshoot of a bill that I originally uh, 
introduced after I read that the federal government had over three million acres of land that they wished to uh, uh, dispose of and, and obtain the uh, proceeds from because uh, the land was um, remote, isolated, inaccessible, or uh, uh, too costly to uh, maintain. And in addition to that, uh, tw uh, over 21,000 excess properties and assets uh, with a total replacement value in June of 2007, they estimated the value at $18 billion, $18 billion. And um, I worked on this legislation with Senator Carper uh, and Senator Coburn on the Senate side and with uh, uh, Chairman Waxman, and Chairman Waxman uh, uh, um, put in uh, uh, the changes that he wanted and, and adopted it as his bill along with uh, uh, my um, co-sponsorship with, with him and this bill actually uh, passed the House uh, uh, in the uh, uh, last Congress. I think it's a good bill. It's, it, uh, here, here's the situation. We keep taking over more and more land and we keep taking it at, fe at the federal, state, and local levels. We keep taking it off the tax rolls, decreasing the tax rolls at the, time, at the same time the schools and all these other agencies are coming to us telling us they need more money. And so uh, this is a way, uh, uh, e even with this bill, uh, government at all levels will continue to be taking over this, uh, taking over much more land every year, taking it off the tax rolls. This is a, a common sense way to uh, get some money for the federal government, for these federal agencies, and also put some uh, properties back into the private uh, sector and back on the uh, tax rolls. It's it's received bipartisan support all through uh, uh, every step of the way, the concerns of the gentleman from Virginia could be easily be addressed in a manager's amendment uh, uh, by the time this bill goes uh, to the uh, floor. But I think it's a good bill and one that uh, has been in the past supported by almost everybody on both sides of the aisle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, gentleman from uh, Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, First, I want to concur with uh, my colleague, Mr. Connolly, and seatmate, um, and the concerns he has. And I look forward to working with uh, Mr. Connolly and the chair on language that is appropriate. I, I do want to raise one more concern, and I'd be glad to work with the committee in the time before this comes to the floor, and that is this. Uh, in terms of unintended consequences, we have to remember that there are a myriad of federal agencies that have vast holdings of open space land. And while some of that is appropriate to turn over to the private sector, we have to remember that some of these agencies have had a, an all too close relationship with those that lease their land or use their land or have opportunities to exploit that land. And I want to make sure that we're not giving them an additional incentive to have a vast land sale of, of that which is our, our precious open space and is intended for natural purposes. Uh, not all of these federal agencies have had an open mind uh, for the natural resource aspect of the land, and I look forward to working with the chairman and the committee to make sure we protect those lands as well. Mr. Chairman? The yeah, gentleman from uh, California. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I actually, um, as pointed out before, I come from a, very much from the same uh, background of uh, local government as the gentleman from Fairfax County, 18 years in, as mayor and county chairman, the county supervisor back there. But I think that there has been abuses on this issue. And I give you an example in my own county where a Navy base was closed and the city got the Navy base and then contracted out for private developers to use that base. I think there's an assumption too often by the state and the, and the counties and the cities that somehow there is a vested right to all federal lands if the federal, land, uh, federal government doesn't have it. It's almost as if um, what is federal lands within my political subdivision is mine if uh, the feds are going to let it up. And we forget that those federal lands are owned in common by all the people of the United States. And, and all the people have a right to benefit from that one way or the other. In um, all fairness to San Diego on this issue was San Diego City 
actually donated the Navy base originally for use as a Navy base, and that's why they reacquired the property. But the fact is, is that the ability for, pri for local government to take the property and then use it for other uses um, is still there. And private um, uh, entrepreneurs being able to gain access through the local governments has always been an opportunity that we've overlooked. But I think that this bill is the right bill to look at at this time. I think that we need to be serious and look our local government people in the face and say, look, um, this is the American people's property. It may be in your county, your city, but, it's, but you do not own it. Um, and the rights of, benef uh, of uh, benefiting from, these, from this property is universal across the American community, not just limited to those of us that have these federal possessions. And California has huge amounts, as my uh, um, colleagues from California will point out, huge amounts of federal property. Um, I was very concerned that when the federal government abandons an island in the Caribbean that we somehow give it to the territory when um, we have islands in California that are owned by the federal government and up do we, do we now get them in the county or what's going to be the future of those issues? And I think that this bill raises the issue that these are assets that are owned in common and should be utilized for the common good of the entire nation, not just for those who specifically well, happen to be located next to them. I yield well, to the gentleman from Tennessee. Well, thank the gentleman for yielding. Let me, let me just say, because of all the, the programs in the federal government that uh, are purchasing land, far more land is going to be added to federal holdings each year than what, than what would ever be sold under this uh, bill. And once again, I will say most of these uh, 21,000 excess properties are buildings that are no longer being used by the federal government. And, and then there are some uh, 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 vacant lands that they would like to sell because, as I say, they're, they're too costly to maintain or are inaccessible or what, uh, whatever. But what the, pro the problem is, it's so bureaucratic and cumbersome to try to dispose of any kind of federal property now. This is a bill just designed to simplify that process and, and let these federal agencies dispose of some of these properties that uh, they just don't need or that are being too costly to maintain. And, and uh, uh, there, uh, up until this moment, there's never been any um, uh, objection from anyone on either side about any, any of the um, provisions of this legislation. Reclaiming my time, Mr. Chairman, I think that the issue is that we shouldn't set, I think the gentleman from Fairfax wants to look into this, and I think that's legitimate, but I think the issue is we should never set the precedence that once the public has possession of property, it will never be allowed to go into private hands again. If that is going to be the policy of this Congress, we should say it up front. I think this says if it is, there's not a viable use for the federal government, we not only have a right, we have a responsibility to put it back out onto the market and utilize it for the general purpose. Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Any other uh, yeah, gentleman from Virginia? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to respond to my friend from California. That certainly is not my intention. And I agree with uh, his comments that uh, there ought not to be any sense of entitlement that because land is owned by the federal government, that state and local governments automatically take possession of that land and nobody else can have a crack at it. Not at all. I'm worried, however, that unintentionally this legislation, if not clarified, uh, might yield the opposite uh, result, which is that state and lo local governments almost never get a crack at it. And I know my friend, having served in local government, knows that in California and San Diego, for example, there may be good public uses of land we want to preserve. That's my only intention here. It's not to have some, uh, some uh, entitlement right for state and local governments, but it is to try to make sure we reaffirm what is existing policy now, which is they're supposed to be consulted and given a crack at this, and that we're not so infusing the value of land that we make that a, uh, a, a paper right for state and local governments. I would also say to my friend from California, my friend from Tennessee, that if you've had to deal with the federal government on issues, on land transfer issues, I assure you it is also a complex process and sometimes uh, a very difficult one uh, to try to negotiate with the federal government. I don't want to cast a vote that would make it any more difficult, frankly, than it already is. That's my sole intent here. Congress, the gentlewoman from the uh, state of, I mean, I'm sorry, Washington, D.C. It's all right. <laughs> it eventually is going to be a right. state. <laughs> uh, Ms. Chairman, uh, 
<clears throat> I am the chair of a, a subcommittee which has jurisdiction over uh, GSA property as well, normally construction. Uh, I understand that there has been an exchange of letters. I have not seen them, but I'm informed by the committee that there has been an exchange of letters between the two committees uh, and that the committee believes uh, that um, uh, if, if anything, this amendment may simply ratify existing policy. I think the gentleman has raised an important point. Uh, I believe uh, that I would like to have the letters uh, put into the record. That may clarify Without the objection. matter. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And in addition, uh, I believe we should clarify the matter in the report language from this uh, committee so that there can be no misunderstanding about the intention here. Or, uh, and, and I think that intention is one that would be shared by every member uh, of this committee, that if your own jurisdiction had a use, and most often that is a, a use such as the use the gentleman uh, uh, indicated, uh, there seems to me no harm in, in reaffirming uh, the consultation with the local government. I think the combination of the letters between uh, our subcommittee and this committee uh, and um, the report language uh, may well uh, satisfy the gentleman. I would hope so. And I would ask that you continue to work with him in that regard. I think any other members seeking recognition? I now call up H.R. 2495. H.R. 2495, a bill to amend Title 40, United States Code, to enhance authorities with regard to real property that has yet to be reported excess and for other purposes. Right. Uh, I have an amendment at the desk. And let me just say this uh, as we address this amendment. Uh, I'm going against my own policy in order to try and solve the problem that I hear uh, because, you know, uh, the policy is that we get the amendments in advance and we don't like to spring things on people, but uh, uh, the point is that being uh, this seems to be a good amendment, and I think it really gets to where we need to go. So uh, I'm going to deviate from the normal policy in, uh, in this regard. And of course, you want to read the amendment? Amendment to H.R. 2495 offered by Mr. Towns of New York, page 16. Insert after line 8 the following new section, section 7, public benefit conveyances. Nothing in this act shall modify existing preferences and priorities for public benefit conveyances to state and local governments and other eligible recipients as authorized by current law. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes, the gentleman um, from Virginia. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for uh, moving this amendment um, because it will give us, I think, the protection I certainly seek on behalf of state and local governments. Uh, I understand your policy. I, I would simply point out, though, that um, I didn't, you know, because because of the schedule of Congress, I know the the, the uh, agenda and the bills were mailed out uh, after closing hours Friday. Uh, most of us didn't get here until votes late Monday afternoon. I didn't see this bill until Tuesday, uh, and we tried to move as quickly as we could. I'm a new member, so I didn't remember. I wasn't here last year uh, when your voice voted it. So I, I appreciate your indulgence, and I really thank you and your staff for working with us to try to clarify this. Um, I think, uh, I hope the ranking member is comfortable with uh, this restatement of what is in fact existing law and I pledge to work with you, Mr. Chairman, as we move this legislation forward and again, thank you for your consideration. I thank the gentleman from Virginia. Comments on, I recognize the gentlewoman from Ohio. Are you looking for seeking recognition? No. Okay, fine. No other member seeking recognition? So the question now is on the adoption of the amendment. All, all in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Opposes? So the amendment is actually favorably, uh, act, the amendment is actually agreed to, and, and of course, uh, in the opinion of the chair, the A's have it, and of course, uh, we now are, uh, are hearing no other amendments. I now move that the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report H.R. 2495 to the House with the recommendation that the bill do pass. The question is favorably reported, reporting H.R. 249 to the House. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye again. The no, so therefore, no opposes, so, so ordered.
So the bill is now reported to the House as amended. That's right, as amended. I can't forget that because I amended it. Uh, yeah. The committee will now consider H.R. 2092, the Kingman and Heritage Islands Act of 2009. The bill would permit the District of Columbia to use the Kingman and Heritage Islands for recreational, environmental, or educational purposes. H.R. 2092 was introduced by Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton uh, of Washington, D.C. on April 23, 2009. The National Children's Island Act of 1995 required the federal government to transfer a title in the Kingman and Heritage Islands in the Anacosta River to the District of Columbia for use as a children's recreational park. H.R. 2092 would permit the District of Columbia to use the land for nature, theme exhibitions, and other educational uses, including a memorial tree grove dedicated to the district school children who were victims of the September 11 terrorist attacks. I urge all members to support this bill, and I yield to the ranking member for any comments that he might have. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I won't read our statement. We can uh, ask unanimous consent to be part of the record. But we support this legislation and uh, would yield back our time. Do, any other members seeking recognition? The gentlewoman from Washington, D.C. Only a brief statement, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the bipartisan support for the legislation involving 40 landfill acres um, <clears throat> developed by the Corps of Engineers in the 1920s, put to no use, however, so the district sought uh, to use it as a theme park some years ago and decided today there's a better use of it. And yet the theme park language is in it that it reverts if not used for a theme park. Uh, the district wants to use the property uh, essentially for environmental purposes uh, uh, for as a recreation site and uh, most especially to help restoration of the Anacostia uh, River uh, which surrounds it as well as its uh, ecosystem. In fact, the district is already uh, using this landfill uh, island, uh, which we treasure in our midst for that purpose. Um, this is a non-controversial bill. Uh, my, my only uh, 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 amendment to the bill, if I may simply speak to it at this time, Mr. Chairman, is to conform the reversionary clause to the reversionary clauses always used in such transfers to 30 years. Um, and and, and, and the, the, the amendment would say that if the land is not used for these ecosystem purposes, uh, then it could uh, revert and the title would be clear after 30 years. Thank you very much. Any other members seeking recognition? California. Yes. Has this, uh, this is the question to my colleague, has this land been cleaned up uh, environmentally? I, I don't know what the use was for this patch of land, but often uh, we need to have an environmental evaluation of the land since children are going to be on it. Uh, no Martin. children will be on the land. Actually, the land was already transferred, uh, the, the appropriate environmental um, uh, work okay. was done on the land. Now it will be used for recreation and environmental purposes only. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, no other members seeking recognition. I now call up H.R. 2092, the Kingman and Heritage Island Act of 2009. H.R. 2092, a bill to amend the National Children's Island Act of 1995 to allow to expand allowable uses for Kingman and Heritage Island. Ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendments at any point. Without objections. So ordered. Are there any amendments? I understand that we Mr. have Chairman, at least I one amendment to consider. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I, I have an amendment of the desk. I've spoken uh, to the amendment to allow uh, the land to uh, title to pass to the district after 30 years, um, uh, the usual reversionary clause. Uh, the clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 2092 offered by Ms. Norton, page without, 3. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read. Any other members seeking recognition on the amendment? I thank the gentlewoman for offering this amendment. This amendment clarifies the federal government's uh, reversionary interest 
and of course allows the district of to use the island in a productive manner, and I'm prepared to support it. I yield to the ranking member for any comments that he might have at this time. Mr. Chairman, we're fine with the amendment. Do any other members wish to be heard on the amendment? If no other members wish to be heard on the amendment, the question is on adopting the Norton Amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposers say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Are there any further amendments? Hearing no amendments, I now move that the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report H.R. 2092 to the House with the recommendation that the bill do pass. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 2092 to the House. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposers say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to, and H.R. 2092 is ordered reported. Our next order of business is H.R. 2711, the FBI Families of Fallen Heroes Act. I'm pleased to be an original co-sponsor of this bipartisan legislation, which was introduced by, my, uh, uh, by Congressman Mike Rogers of Michigan and several members of the Oversight Committee, including Mr. Foster, um, Mr. Cummings, Mr. Lynch, and Mr. Bill Bray. H.R. 2711 is an important measure that will authorize the FBI to pay the relocation and moving expenses of families to of FBI agents who are killed in the line of duty. Under current law, the FBI is authorized to pay these expenses if an FBI agent or employee is killed overseas, but cannot pay for relocation if the death occurs in the United States. FBI employees and their families are routinely moved by the Bureau from within the United States to take on assignments that further the mission of the agency and the security of the country. While we wish this legislation was not necessary, there tragically have been instances in the recent past where such authority was needed to support the families of agents of employees who, have, who, who gave their lives. I encourage all members to support this important measure and yield now to the ranking member for any comments that he might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, we obviously support this bill. It's a good piece of legislation. Caring for families of FBI agents who are killed in the line of duty is, um, should be a priority for this Congress and for our country. And so we support the legislation. And I would point out to the Chairman that we do have an amendment coming that I think is, um, will make the bill even better. Thank you. We'll get right. back. Uh, if any other members wish to speak. I now call up H.R. 2711. And I ask unanimous consent that the, the bill be considered. H.R. 2711, a bill to amend Title V United States Code to provide for the transportation of the dependents, remains, and effects of certain federal employees. I ask consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendments at any point without objection. So ordered. Are there any amendments? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Will clerk, designate the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 2711 offered by Mr. Chaffetz. Page 2, line 21, strike continental. Page 3, line 19, insert and after the semicolon. Page 3, line 24, strike quote and and insert a period. Page 4, strike lines 1 through 2. Mr. Chief is recognized to speak on his amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll be brief. This is a simple amendment. The, the way the, the bill is moving forward uh, is, is a wonderful piece of legislation. My, my grandfather was a career FBI agent. Uh, thank goodness we never had to go through some of the tragedies that are the good men and women who are serving this country are having to go through. But what the amendment does is it simply strikes the word continental and and therefore it just says within the United States. The relocation expenses the way the bill is currently uh, uh, written would limit it to moving within the continental United States. Certainly, if you're serving, for instance, in, in uh, Philadelphia, and yet you needed to move back to Hawaii, we would certainly, I'm sure, all be in the spirit of supporting that. So it just simply says we're going to get rid of the word continental, therefore allowing people to move back to anywhere within the United States and not exclude our friends and loved ones uh, that may be in places outside of the continental United States and just define it more clearly as the United States. Uh, and the example I use, again, is uh, the one of Hawaii and, and Alaska. We, should, we certainly wouldn't want to exclude those people along the way. 
The amendments makes a lot of sense, and we're prepared to accept uh, it. Mr. Chairman. They want to thank the gentleman. Yes. A question yeah. of the presenter. Uh, when you say just the United States, suppose uh, an FBI agent was over the border in uh, Canada or in Mexico, would this exclude their remains from being moved back? My, that, my, that's current law. My understanding is that the current law does take care of people who are serving overseas. That's, I want to what this amendment does is it simply says that we, the, the Bureau would be allowed to move them anywhere within the United States, gotcha. not just the continental United States. Thank you. Any other uh, members seeking recognition? The question is now on the amendment. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Opposes? So the amendment is agreed to. Are, are there any further amendments? Okay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, but now I know, now I move that the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report H.R. 2711 to the House with the recommendation that the bill do pass. The question is now favorably reporting H.R. 2711 to the House. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposes say no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to, and H.R. 2711 is ordered and reported. And one more, right? One more. The final order of business will be resolutions and postal naming bills. I ask unanimous consent that these resolutions and bills be considered in block. And, and read and open to amendment at any time. These resolutions and postal naming bills include H. Conrad's 163 introduced by Representative Jerry Moran. Uh, this measure expresses support for the goals and ideas of National Job Corps Day. H. Res 441 introduced by Representative Marcy Capture of this committee honors the historical contributions of Catholic sisters in the United States. H. Res 679 introduced by uh, Representative uh, Deborah Harrison uh, expresses uh, support for the goals and ideas of American Legion Day. H.R. 2215, introduced by Representative Thaddeus Makata, designates a facility of the United States Postal Service located in Garden City, Michigan, as the John Shivin, Shivnin Post Office Building. H.R. 3319, introduced by Representative Tom McClintock designates a facility of the United States Postal Service in Portola, California as the Army Specialist Jeremiah Paul McCleary Post Office Building. H.R. 3386 introduced by Representative Leonard, Leonard Boswell designates a facility of the United States Postal Service in Des Moines, Iowa as the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans Memorial Post Office. Having satisfied the committee's criteria, each of these measures are worthy of support, and I therefore urge their adoption. Uh, does the ranking member uh, have any comments on any of these bills? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We've reviewed the namings and resolutions and find they meet the requirements of the committee, and uh, we support them. Any other back. comments from any of Yes, the gentleman from uh, Virginia. Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to uh, particularly uh, note HRES 441 and thank our colleague Marcy Kaptur for introducing this. Uh, my wife. I uh, was a Roman Catholic nun for seven years. I married her after she left the convent. Uh, and I know she'd, uh, she'd want me to thank you too, Ms. Kaptur, and if you don't object, I'd love to be listed as a co-sponsor. And I thank the gentleman for, for Virginia for further clarification. <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Uh, gentleman Chairman, from uh, Ohio. I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and members of the committee for their support. Um, I will also ask unanimous consent to place some remarks in the record, uh, but may I just state uh, officially that I originally introduced this resolution to commemorate and celebrate the historic as well as contemporary contributions to American life of Catholic women religious. They have served in our country and serve our country uh, since 1727. Uh, they have fearlessly and often sacrificially committed their personal lives to teaching, healing, and social action. They participated in the opening of the West. Uh, they nursed soldiers during the Civil War. They have cared for afflicted populations during the epidemics of the 19th and 20th centuries. They've established the largest private school system in our country, founded more than 110 U.S. colleges and universities through which they have educated millions of Americans. 
They managed such organizations long before such positions were even open to women in our society, and their bold passion has established hospitals across our country, orphanages, charitable institutions, and they have been among the first to stand with the underprivileged, to work and educate among the poor and underserved, and to facilitate leadership development through opportunity and example. We all know them because they provide shelter, food, and basic human needs to the economically and socially disadvantaged in the communities that we represent, and they relentlessly fight for fair and equal treatment of all persons working for the eradication of poverty and racism, uh, the promotion of nonviolence, equality and democracy, and principle uh, in action. We know their dedication to peace and justice in our country and around the world. I might just close by saying that this year a traveling exhibit entitled Women in Spirit, Catholic Sisters in America will be touring our country. It began in Cincinnati, Ohio uh, uh, this year, and it celebrates their lives. And um, I thank my colleagues for, um, uh, and our chairman, uh, Mr. Towns, for allowing us to give Catholic sisters the honorable recognition they deserve, not only for the personal impact they've had in our lives, but for the extraordinary contributions they've made to the history of the United States. And I thank you for allowing me to make that statement. Gentlewoman for her, her comments. Gentleman from Ohio. I'm pleased to uh, support Ms. Kaptur's bill. I think I could, uh, say that if it wasn't for the good sisters, I wouldn't be here today. Thank you, Sister Leona. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen, very much for his comments as well. I ask unanimous consent that the measures previously described be reported favorably by the committee and without objection so ordered. Uh, this concludes our business for today. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make technical and conforming changes to all matters ordered reported without objection, so ordered. So the committee now stands adjourned. <laughs>